Ryan Brown, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast, my friend. Thanks, man. I'm really honored to be here. Honored to have you here. I love what you're doing. Um, you do a really good job educating a lot of people. Your content is awesome. Your YouTube channel is awesome. I was just telling you offline, asking you how you do your great editing. And I learned that you uh, studied that in college, which makes sense because the editing is on point. So everybody go subscribe to his YouTube channel. We'll drop a link down below. If you're watching on YouTube, it's a very easy transition as well. Uh, let's get into your backstory because your your story is really interesting and relatable to a lot of people who are doing everything right. I'm putting that in quotation marks, but they they still have chronic fatigue, some weird diagnosis and, and many, many symptoms. And you went through that gamut. So let's go back to some of the challenges. When, when did you start to notice some of those symptoms? What were they? And what was your journey like? It's really interesting. So I sort of look at my life now in in, in eras almost like this era of Ryan, there's always like the, it's like pre, post and current. Um, and really my journey began eight years ago when I was 88 pounds. I was dealing with severe anorexia, um, never was hospitalized, just really, I'd, I'd gone through a terrible breakup in high school, uh, a bunch of childhood trauma that I didn't realize until years later was really affecting me and, and actually caused me to go into that sort of anorexic mindset and trying to push me over the edge. I didn't realize that for years after I recovered actually. But um, I, eight years ago, I was 88 pounds, uh, suffering really hardcore mentally. And then I thought I had kind of gotten myself out of the weeds when I restored my weight. My doctor said I didn't have anorexia anymore because in the medical setting, um, you're better when you don't look like you're a concentration camp victim. And yeah. how tall are you? I'm 5'9". And so, wow, so five, nine, 88 pounds. If you could imagine that, that is really wickedly skinny. Yeah. And for me, I didn't, and I was in college at the time. I was, uh, I was a sophomore in college at my, at my worst. And, and how did that, how did that like going to school? Like how, did that affect like your self-esteem? You know, it was, it didn't really bother me self-esteem wise. Uh, I actually did everything I was doing at the time was in the guise of me being healthier. Like I actually, it was, it was health anxiety. And it was, it was sort of like my life had fallen apart, went through this huge breakup, um, my first love sort of thing. And I was like, what can I control in my life? And a lot of eating disorders, I work with a lot of people that have eating disorders. I'm eating disorder uh, certified coach. And so you kind of uh, realize that eating disorders generally are all about control. And so for me, I could control my fitness. I can control what I was eating. And I've always been a pretty slanky, skinny kid, <clears throat> ran track in high school. And I didn't, I never needed to lose weight. I've never been overweight, but because losing weight is in right now, so many people need to lose weight. There's like all of that over social media. I kind of got into the idea of cutting. And then my idea was I was going to do a little bit of a bulk and, and gain muscle. I didn't need to cut. And, and then all I ended up doing was just being stuck in this cut cycle till all of a sudden I, uh, one day was filming something for, for my digital media college class. And I had to jump off a one foot ledge into frame of camera. And I jumped off this one foot ledge and I couldn't even hold my own body weight from that force of impact. And I collapsed wow. completely. Didn't shatter any bones, luckily. Um, but that was kind of the moment for me initially when I was like, wow, I am sick and I need to remedy this. And so uh, the only way I knew how and the only way that I was trained through standard of care and working with uh, the standard of care nutritionists who I don't want to send any hate to or anything, they, they're doing their best and they're in a flawed system, but was to just eat anything I could to gain weight. And that's basically what I did to get to a set point, which was like 130 pounds or so. But that's kind of the beginning of my story. And uh, it sort of got worse actually from there. When you, when, you, when you got to your set point of weight, were you still in college or were you out of college? So I was out of college by then. Um, so I actually did uh, two years of, of college in high school. So I only had like two years left in in actual college, I graduated high school with my associates. So I, I was basically in my degree program and I knew what I wanted to do. So I, I graduated at like 110 pounds probably, uh, wow. which is kind of wild. Like looking back at my photos, I'm like, I can't believe I actually had the energy to go to class and like Seriously? take tests. Oh my gosh. Cause I remember I would be, I'd be wiped by like 4 PM. Like I'd, I'd be in bed by eight and just like out. Cause I had no energy. 
Did you ever take your body fat? Did you know what your body fat was? I, I never did. I can't imagine. It must have been like sub 3%. I was like, my Jeez. my skin was like paper thin. It was it was really bad. Um, I, so you did? You, go ahead. Oh, no. I have like photos of myself from back then in 2015 when this was going on. And like, I'm just, I am a skeleton. Like you can see every single bone in my body completely. That's wild. And you, so you did essentially like a dirty bulk. You just ate whatever, um, calories, empty calories just to get the weight back. And, and then what ended up happening after that, you got to that set point of weight, but what else occurred? So my energy never returned. Um, I, <clears throat> I, I really had crashed energy up until like this last year and a half, really, when I started looking into other, other, uh, non standard of care means sort of, uh, and that was like concerning to me because I was told that everything would normalize after I reached my set point weight and sort of was there for a while. And so I started cleaning up my diet a little bit. This is around 2016, 17 now. Um, I started cleaning up my diet and, and I ate more of what I would say is like a standard quote bodybuilding style diet. I was trying to like put on muscle weight, but not dirty bulk anymore. So I wasn't like doing cheat days or anything, but I was eating lots of oatmeal, egg whites, Way a lot of tuna, which becomes a very important part of my story. A tuna every single day for four years. Um, wow. So you can foreshadow that one. But um, mm-hmm. uh, so I was eating a lot of like a lot of that stuff, but my energy was still just like terrible, and I couldn't figure it out. Um, I definitely was still over exercising. I never took a rest days. I was going seven days a week for like two and a half hours in the gym, and wow. I never really addressed the traumas like I mentioned before, for the reasons I actually you know began eating disorder behavior in the first place. And that also becomes an important part of my journey too, because I realized later after I started developing other symptoms of autoimmunity and things, which we'll get into, that I realized I was still like, I never actually fixed anything. If anything, what I did was I broke my body. I sort of restored it from a physical standpoint on the outside looking in or outside, but I was still very much um, hormones crashed, thyroid tanked. Um, it was still a mess. That, that's, um, that's something people, a lot of people deal with. Now you had the opposite problem, meaning most people want to lose weight and you needed to gain weight. And it's still the the same approach that you followed is the same approach. Many people follow that fails, which is a symptom chasing sort of, um, approach. So if somebody is overweight, uh, conventional wisdom teaches you, we need to lose weight, to get healthy. If you're underweight, we need to, you know, gain weight to get healthy, but it's really get healthy to do X, Y, Z. So you started to, um, understand that at, at what point did you understand that? And did you get into uh, ketosis actually? Yeah. So that, um, this is about 2019. Now I was, uh, living in LA at the time and I was just sitting, I was hanging out after a day of work and I was out playing a video game. And I was also watching TV at the same time because I like to multitask. Uh, and I was, I noticed my hand started tingling. It was my right hand. And I started tingling like in the palm. And I figured like, oh man, maybe I'm getting like some carpal tunnel because I'm at the computer all day. Like I was an editor by trade. So I'm always like doing this all day long. And uh, my friend told me it was carpal tunnel. I was like, all right. So I started wearing my brace. And within about three weeks, um, the tingling had spread from my hand to this hand, up my elbows, into my feet, and all the way, pretty much my entire body. Like I had it in my face, my back, my legs, and I started freaking out. And uh, that's sort of when I started really seeing how flawed our medical system actually was. Um, I already disliked it through all the anorexia stuff I had to go through, especially through like working with nutritionists. I knew that they were I mean, I, I kind of gave him the benefit of the doubt because I, I was dealing with the mental stuff and I thought maybe I'm just being like too harsh on these people. But um, I started taking all, getting all these tests and my doctors were basically telling me I was normal. I, nothing, nothing was coming back. Everything looked pretty good. Um, but uh, it took about six months and then I was finally diagnosed with something called uh, small fiber neuropathy, which is sure um, if you I'm sure you've heard of neuropathy it happens a lot with diabetics and stuff like that, but this isn't in the motor nerves. It's actually just in the sensory nerves of the skin. And so the only way they can test for that is through something called a skin punch biopsy. And they basically do a whole punch of your skin in three areas, your wrist, hip, and ankle. And they look at how dense and lengthy the nerve fibers are. And mine 
supposed to look like a forest because your nerve fibers and mine looked like it had been deforested. Like they weren't, they were not there. And so that's actually, I, I went to uh, the best doctors in the United States, went all the way to Boston, Boston, Massachusetts uh, hospital, uh, Brigham and women's really beautiful hospital. Um, did a bunch of tests, told me I had that, uh, told me they couldn't really do anything for me besides like, give me gabapentin, which is a uh, benzodiazepine. Uh, and I didn't really want to do that. And so that's when I started looking into functional medicine, uh, as a suggestion from my therapist. And that's kind of what opened this door to a whole world of, of health that I never thought of, because like you said, I was symptom chasing, like many of us do. And I realized, wow, all these things that probably have been, uh, started, you know, started coming down the line eight years ago have now manifested. And really I got to address the root cause of my health, which is achieving actual health and not trying to just treat symptoms, if that makes sense. Total, it makes total sense. And I believe symptoms are, we need to look at symptoms differently than when we, the way we look at it, meaning the innate intelligence in, in your body is there. It's built there. I, I believe God put it there, but the reason you're experiencing a symptom is the innate intelligence is kind of giving you some warnings, right? So that started eight years ago. And then if you don't really get to the cause and you just chase the symptoms, another symptom pops up, another symptom pops up. It's like driving in the road, the check engine light. If you just cover it up and keep driving, it's going to lead to more problems. So we need to pull over the car to the side of the road, open up the hood and figure out what's going on. And you, this is the point where you got to when you started to get into functional medicine. So what were some of the things when you opened up the hood of you know, your hidden stressors, what were some of the things that you discovered? Yeah. So one of my, my heroes is Terry Walls, who has a really compelling story of overcoming multiple sclerosis, um, progressive MS actually. And so it was actually her that I discovered first, because at first I thought my symptoms could be MS because of how rapid they came on and how widespread they were. And so I went through all the MRIs, nothing. So I was like, dang, I actually wanted MS, which is sad. Because mm -hmm. I wanted something, you wanted a diagnosis. I wanted you wanted a something. Name. I wanted something to blame, and that's something that I'm actually pretty against now. Um, because at the end of the day, the way I tend to treat things, as far as like how I look at it with my own body, is like I'm probably going to tackle it almost the same way, no matter what. I'm going to look for the same things, basically, whether mm -hmm. it's MS or whether it's Crohn's or or RA, or rheumatoid arthritis. I'm probably going to like look for the same things. Um, and that's what the beauty of functional medicine is looking at the whole body versus just the one area. But, um, sorry, what was the question? I just went off on the tangent. I was talking about Terry Walls. The, the, yeah. And, and by the way, it's funny that you brought up Terry Walls. Cause just like two hours ago, her team reached out to me and she, she wants to come on my podcast. So I awesome. just booked her. I, I can't wait to talk about She's that. Great. So yeah, stay tuned for those watching and listening. The question was when you opened up the hood and started to uncover uh, the hidden stressors that loaded your stress bucket, what, what did you find there? Yeah. So a lot of the things were, um, I mean, some of them were pretty wild. I mean, the, the, uh, the most obvious one that came to me very early on, even before I even started looking at functional medicine stuff was mercury. And that's because I had been eating tuna for four, literally daily for four years, like multiple times a day, like two meals that are almost tuna. I was very poor. Typical I was bodybuilder yeah, lifestyle. Then I was pretty poor and I lived in LA and everything was expensive. <laughs> so I was like, I, I can afford cans of tuna. I literally had a wall that was just like cans of tuna and oatmeal next to each other. Um, did you also have, did you also get exposed to mercury by silver fillings? Did you happen to have that? Or I no? never had any metal fillings. I think that was kind of before. I mean, that that's much more common in, in a people. Not to call you old or anything, just, just, just <laughs> hey, like, they still do it. They though. do still they do still, it. I, I knew, yeah, I knew those were bad. So I, I kind of avoided those, but it was mainly that I'm sure like I had, I, I mean, I lived in a very polluted city, so I'm sure I was breathing in heavy metals. Yeah. Um, we all do. Yeah. But, but it was, that was the first thing that came up and all my doctors dismissed me on this one. They just, and I don't know why they, they didn't. Cause I told them I ate tuna every day for four years and I don't know, I don't know if they didn't take me serious, but they refused to test me for it forever. I had to like really like twist my doctor's arm to like get him to do a blood test, which for those of you that don't know when you're testing for mercury, a blood test is only really accurate for acute, acute, or like if you're continuing to consume things with it in it. Otherwise it's like completely useless within like a number of weeks because your body will flush it and put it into tissues pretty quickly because right. it doesn't yeah. want it in the blood. But because mm -hmm. I, I was, uh, consuming these things, it came back pretty dang high. And I actually later tested, um, 
my 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 hair follicle levels and they were super high like i actually had the nurse that i don't know how i got to do it through a hospital but um i got to do it through a hospital and they called me and the nurse was like oh your mercury is really high wow. and they were freaking out like she had no idea what to do and i was like i'll figure it out <laughs> don't worry yeah, about it. i got this but then, so that was kind of the first the first domino that I, I i figured out the first like chess piece in the right direction for for things for me what I didn't. So you stop eating tuna. I, I would imagine. Yeah, I, I, I still ha I haven't had tuna in in like three years, um, but I, I am back on eating fish just because I've got my mercury pretty leveled out. Yeah. Um, and for those listening, you explained it very well. It's like a blood test will look at acute, but um, it's not going to give you chronic. So if you have silver fillings, that probably won't show up in a blood test. It'll sh you have to use a, a chelation agent, mm -hmm. challenge it out of the, the the tissues and bones. So um, you know, just understand that there's a right way to test. And the bigger the fish, the more toxins it's going to have. It's tuna, uh, shark, uh, whatever big fish, it's going to bioaccumulate more toxins. The smaller will have less. So things like salmon and sardines are going to be a safer option. Yep, uh, that's like my those are my that's like my lifeblood right now. Salmon and sardines. Um, those are good. But uh, so that was kind of the first major one. And um, luckily, I had a very supportive family during this time. All of them are very supportive of of my journey, and they knew something was wrong. And I think having that, I mean, unfortunately having that anorexia past in, before me, they, they knew to take me seriously with my, my problems. Mm -hmm. And, um, I learned a bunch of other things within the next year because I, I got into the space. I, I started doing, um, the Terry walls, the walls diet, and I went to level three, which is a ketosis version of it. So I was getting pretty deep into ketosis. I was tracking it. Um, I stopped eating like all processed foods completely. Um, I basically cooked every meal that I could and I'm, and I'm not very, I'm not like a chef. So like all the meals I do, if I can't do them in like 30 minutes or less, I don't do it. So everything <laughs> I do is pretty simple. Um, yeah. but I was like, I was getting into keto and then I started looking at all these other things. I was starting to read people's books. Um, and then I learned about hormones. And so I was like, oh man, I should probably get those checked. And lo and behold, my hormones, all of them, um, were trashed like my thyroid. I had pretty bad hypothyroid, which I assumed I had for years because I was cold all the time, mm. basically since anorexia. I think I think since I had anorexia eight years ago and it was really low weight, I think honestly my hormones were crashed since then and I just yeah. never thought about it. Well, um, you said you were doing 1,100 calories a day. I mean, that's going to slow down yeah. your metabolism and, and the mercury has an affinity for the thyroid gland. It attacks it. Yeah. And it, actually a good point about the calorie mark was uh, there was a point where I was living in LA and I could actually maintain my weight of like 125, 130 pounds eating 1,000 to 1,100 calories a day and working wow. and working out like every day. So that really kind of throws some mud into the calories in, calorie out thing because I I... I was, and I was freaking out because I was like, you can't live like this. Like, this is not good. <laughs> but, um, but I found out by basically like part way into my journey too, that my testosterone, I had a total testosterone level of like a hundred, wow. which was like extremely low. And basically and I, you, you in your twenties, right? At that point, I was 24 when I got them yeah, tested. I, I was very low for anybody, but especially a 24 year old. Yeah. And so, um, that just sent me down a whole nother roller coaster. I also had, um, osteopenia. Uh, mm -hmm. low bone density. And that's probably from my anorexia days. Cause that's one, one of the first things to go when you lose that much weight and maintain that low weight is your bone density like, is one of the first things that goes out of the window. Um, but I've actually had some pretty good DEXA scans recently and it's actually coming back up, which is, which is awesome. awesome. But, um, so I really, I think the most, the, the most critical things were that. And then I was looking back and I started learning about mold toxicity. And mm -hmm. I realized that when I was living in LA and even, uh, in my home here, that my basement and my rooms had flooded multiple times and we actually found uh, i think it was i think it's black mold the black mold mm -hmm. the really nasty stuff mm -hmm. and i was living in that for over a year mm -hmm. and ever since we ever since i moved out of that environment and cleaned up this environment my energy uh complete 180. it was it's insane um a lot of a lot of folks so basically my focus has been like uh pretty heavy ketosis for a while, lots of detoxing. And I was working with practitioners this whole time because I also have MTHFR, which for people, if they don't know, that's methylation, detoxing. That's one of those things that controls that. Mine turns out to be one of the ones that doesn't do it very great. So I have mm -hmm. to kind of do it extra hard. So I sauna a lot, 
Um, but the last piece of the puzzle for me was working on mindset and, mm -hmm. and really, cause I'd always been sort of, uh, a pessimist, um, mm -hmm. most of my life. And it was really, I think the, the real final piece of the puzzle was, was putting that together and really being optimistic and, and focusing on the good things that are going on, even when everything's still kind of coming together. Um, because you can do all the right things. I really believe that if you have the wrong mindset or if you're really down on yourself, your body listens to that message you're sending it and it will make you feel like crap despite all the good you're doing. And so that's like a huge message that I try to tell people is to really focus on mindfulness and, and, and looking at the good that they're doing and, and giving themselves grace. Great. So important. It, it's really, I, I believe success is 95% mindset, 5% strategy. Mm -hmm. Now the strategy needs to be really good, like what you did, but the mindset part, it, it's a universal law. Whether somebody thinks, you know, the mindset stuff and positive thinking is woo woo. Um, it's not, I mean, it's a universal law. What you feed energy to expands, just like gravity is a universal law. If you don't believe in gravity, I could show you, I could hold something, even though you don't believe in it, I'll drop it and boom, you <laughs> see it right before your eyes. You know, I just dropped the cap here. So what, what were some of the things like, did you get into some books and authors for mindset? What were the specific things you did to, um, reprogram the paradigm of being, uh, negative and pessimistic. You know, it's really interesting. I had a good friend of mine who, uh, we actually did a podcast together for a little bit. His name's Tommy. Um, we both had anorexia around the same time. So we kind of became each other's support system those wow. many years ago and we had kept in contact and we just kind of, uh, we both became eating disorder, eating disorder recovery coaches. And so I learned a lot going through those trainings of, 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 uh, how to deal with, um, when you kind of get into that spiral thought process and you just spiral and spiral and it doesn't ever stop. Um, so I learned a lot of things like tapping. So it's sort of distraction methods, um, tapping various parts of your body. Um, but really the biggest one for me was I do a lot of journaling. Uh, I, I start my day with journaling, uh, most days where I just, I, I literally just sit down in my red light and I just like write good things that are going on in my life today. Um, and that actually, I mean, I, it's so funny because when I first learned about these these methods, I thought they were kind of the dumbest like hippie crap you could do. I'm like, there's no way that this stuff like works. But there, you really have to believe, and once you believe in something, like great things can happen. There's like there's a real like strong uh, strong, and I don't even care if it's placebo. Like it, that's the that's yeah, the beauty of it. Super strong. Yeah, but um, my my favorite things are are really to do the the journaling, and then also um, spend as much time as as feasible outside in nature and grounding myself and just literally practicing sitting, doing nothing and just breathing. I think breath work is some of the most powerful, um, like mindset tools I've ever had. Like it calms me down like that. And, uh, that's, that's one thing that I teach a lot of people is like, especially single nostril breathing. That's a really mm -hmm. good one. Uh, box breathing is a fun one. Uh, but those are kind of my main tools that I use. And also for people that I work with and help them do that. And, and they're free, yeah, uh, you know, free. there's no money required at all. Even with the journaling, the gratitude journaling, I love that. I call it, I call it vitamin G, yeah. vitamin gratitude. It's the world's most potent drug in the world, strongest vitamin in the world. What you appreciate, appreciate. So you started to journal the things that were going right. And then you got more things that went right for you. And I, I do the same thing in the morning. Best time to do that when the subconscious mind is really impressionable. And I think what you realize when you start journaling is you really have more good things going on in your life than you realize you do. I think it's, mm -hmm. and it's like, it's like getting negative comments on a social media feed or a post. It's the one comment that's negative that, that, that comes out to you when there's thousands of good ones. Yeah. And so it's, it's kind of the same principle. It's like, we're filled with all of these thoughts, thousands of thoughts throughout the day. And I think something like 85% of them are negative uh, yeah. usually. And those are the right. ones you hold on to. And so what I really try to do is, is reframe those, reframe those thoughts. Like if something stressful happens, like the other day, I actually uh, got in a minor car accident, just like a, just a d little dent kind of thing. And I could have just freaked out and been pissed at myself the rest of the day for being an idiot and like not paying attention to where I was backing out. But instead, you know, I stopped in that moment. I took a breath. And I was just like, well, you know, this happened. It's not going to change my life dramatically. And tomorrow the sun will rise again. And at the end of the day, you know, nobody got hurt. 
And I try to look at the good positive aspects in the situation. And so I think that's a powerful tool. It's hard to do. It's probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is work on mindfulness things. And it's the hardest things to make yourself do. Like mm -hmm. you'll be surprised how hard it is to sit in grass and breathe and do nothing but that. Um, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life, but it's also the most rewarding. So I think it's, it's the, probably the most powerful tool that anyone can just pull out of their arsenal at any time. So I'm a huge proponent of those. I love it. Yeah, it really is one of our greatest powers as a human being, the beings, the power to change your thoughts. And if we have, it's estimated about 60,000 thoughts per day. And to your point, 85% of them or so are negative and 90% of them are the same thoughts from yesterday. It's like, you could really do some things to overcome that. I don't know if you um, saw me share this, but uh, Bob Proctor, who's this guy right there, uh, he's somebody who I've studied over the years, changed my life, saved my life. But he was uh, sharing a story. I was studying him and he was sharing a story about being in the backseat of a car. This was like a 1970 something. It was on a sales road trip and he was looking at clouds and using his thoughts to make clouds disappear with his thoughts. Right. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, uh, I got to try this. Right. So I, I went into my balcony here where I live in Miami beach, Florida, and I, I chose a cloud, a small cloud. And I start focusing on it with my thoughts and imagining that it was dissipating before my eyes. And it literally before my eyes, that one cloud, not the clouds around it, but that one cloud disappeared, Ryan, right before my eyes. And I remember I ran into my uh, bedroom where my fiance was and I'm like, I just made a cloud disappear with my thoughts. And she thought it was crazy. Brought her outside, told her to pick a cloud and she picked it and I made it disappear. And I kept doing that over and over and over, which illustrates like how incredible, how powerful your thoughts are. It's a very potent form of energy. That's fantastic. I've never, I've, I've had, I've actually thought of the concept before, but I didn't realize he was the one who, who like kind of started that whole thing. Cause I've, I've done that where I've just laid in the grass and stared at clouds and just thought about certain things, tell that cloud went away. And then I would look at another cloud, but I yeah. never thought of it in that context as that's, that's actually amazing. That's really yeah. cool. <laughs> Everybody go give it a try. Let us know how it works. For yeah, you. let us know. It really, it really does work. This to illustrate how powerful your thoughts are. So I love that. So you got into, just to kind of recap some of your, some of your journey here, you got into heavy metals. You know, you figured out you had mercury poisoning from eating tuna. You stopped eating the tuna. You did a heavy metals detox. You got into a Terry Wallace protocol, the Wallace protocol, got into ketosis, and then uh, from my understanding, you kind of fell in love with ketosis and you teach a lot of keto now. So let's get into that, right? Let's get into totally. this, wh why you love keto, why you teach it to your, your clients who are following you and online on social media. And um, why do you love it? Let's start with that question right there. I love it because I think it's one of the most powerful therapeutic tools anyone can use as a human being, which I hope we all are that are watching this, um, to, to reset your body and really give yourself your humanity back. Like humans were meant to be in ketosis. I mean, you've done posts about being a baby and as, as a baby, you are in ketosis, like as, mm -hmm. as an infant. And even in the, I think it's the, the, the third or fourth, the last trimester of pregnancy, like women are in ketosis pretty much regardless of what they're doing, which is awesome. Uh, and so it's sort of this like, and it's, it's bigger now. I mean, we'll, we'll get into like dirty keto and kind of mainstream keto soon, but it's, it's one of those things where it's sort of like a forgotten part of like being human, sort of like mm. sunlight, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's, it's really, I really got fascinated by it and what it could do for the body. And because I had dealt with nervous system problems and mental health disorders, um, ketosis seemed from the research I was doing at the time to be a really therapeutic tool for those two specific things. And so I was like game. I went a hundred percent balls to the walls, like immediately, which I don't necessarily tell people to do, but I was like, so committed to, to just like, I was in such a desperate state. I was like, I will do anything right now. I will throw out every cookie I have and, and never touch it again. If I can just like feel 50% better. And that's kind of what I told myself when I jumped into it. And uh, it changed my life. And now I sort of do more of a cyclical in and out because I'm more metabolically flexible. Right. But right. like we'll talk about so many people, especially in the United States, are met so metabolically inflexible that it would, it would behoove you to, to not go into ketosis despite whatever time of year it is. Um, mm -hmm. Because like so many people are so insulin resistant that you got to learn how to reflip that switch. And it doesn't happen overnight when you haven't ever done it before, you know? 
Yep. Yeah. And to your point, um, 88% plus of American adults are metabolically inflexible. They need ketosis, which is just simply, like you said, it's a metabolic process. It's been around forever. It might be nuanced, but nothing new about it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the mistakes. Uh, I mean, you've seen it. You, you see people, people are jumping on the keto bandwagon. You know, we have keto coaches left and right. We have people teaching keto. What is the issue with the way most people, what, what do you see wrong with the way most people teach keto out there? I think, and it is less about the way they teach it and more about everyone's trying to promote their own brand. So they need to take a stance on a way, in, in a way that, that differentiates them from other people, which is cool. Like I get it. I mean, I, I play the game too. Like we all have to play the game to, to be seen and heard and all that stuff. But I think the problem most people have is, is they overcomplicate it. It's really, really simple. And so I really try to make it simple for people and, and not, not super confusing. But I mean, the, I mean, the, right now, I think the biggest mistake I see people make is, is, the, is, is really the keto treat thing right now. Uh, I have a lot of, uh, I have like, this is a question I get asked about like more times than I can count. Um, even from, especially from clients is like, they'll see things that are labeled keto at the store and they go for it and they wonder why they still feel like crap when it's keto. Um, and I tell people like, there's nothing in the world, whether it's labeled keto or not, that's going to beat real food, like real one ingredient food. You're never going to beat that. So that's like a big thing is like, I try, I mean, you can dabble in them, but don't make it like a keto, like processed food, a mainstay in your keto diet, because it's not species appropriate. I'm very much about like being a species appropriate eater. And that really puts me in the fringe when I, you know, coming from an eating disorder. I've been told I still have an eating disorder a thousand times because mm -hmm. I refuse to eat pizza. Um, and it's not because I'm scared of pizza, but it doesn't serve my body any purpose yeah. um, beyond a dopamine hit that I can get from doing something more appropriate, I guess. Mm -hmm. So the first uh, thing is like, just focus on real food, like real food all the way. Um, and then another thing that I think that people get wrong, or I guess not necessarily wrong, but could do better is, um, I mean, actually, I'd love to talk about uh, the protein thing. Yeah. Um, because I think there's a little bit of a misnomer. And I totally, I totally thought this was true too, is when people, um, I think people think keto is just like eating like tons of, I, I think people mix up keto and Atkins all the time too, which is, do. Which is yep. also a problem because Atkins is more, more protein based than, than fat based. Um, so that, that's like another differentiation, but I think people think that you can eat way too much protein on keto and that'll like kick you out of ketosis and all these things. And I want people to know, like, if you're just starting to get into keto anyway, I wouldn't worry about being like, I wouldn't worry about your ketone levels right out of the gate. Cause you're probably not even going to be able to achieve it for a little bit. If you're not being able to flip that fat switch on, which you won't for like several weeks or even longer sometimes. Um, so for me, I always figured that you had to keep your protein macros pretty low and your fat really, really high in order to stay into ketosis. But what I've discovered through my own kind of N of one experience, experiment within the last year and a half or so, because I've been trying to put on some more muscle too, is uh, I raised my protein up into a threshold that I thought would like definitely kick me out. I thought I was going to get gluconeogenesis, which is the process of your body turning protein amino acids into glucose. Um, I thought that was going to kick me out of ketosis, but what I found is actually, it's really, really hard to do that. And I'm still mm -hmm. producing ketones, even eating like 150 grams of protein a day, which is quite a lot. Like I'm 135 pounds now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I set mine at my ideal body weight goal for protein. Um, yep. and it's really hard to like, once you, especially once you get metabolically flexible, once you're there. Um, it's really hard to kick you out of ketosis. I don't know if that's what you've seen with yourself and clients too, but that's what yeah, I've that's seen. exactly what I've seen. And I used to have the same thought process of like you know moderate to low protein because of the glu gluconeogenesis, and then started testing myself. Never happened to me. I never really got kicked out. And then I had a lot of my Keto Camp Academy students test, so, so I get an idea if that really is the truth. And it was really uncommon. It, it's, it's, a, it's the exception. It might happen to, you know, somebody, but it's, it's definitely the exception to the rule, meaning it's, it's not common to get bumped out of ketosis by eating too much protein. And let's face it, if you're eating animal based protein, like you said, species appropriate protein, 
it's really hard to overdo it with animal animal based protein. Yeah. It's very satiating. So maybe you could talk about the difference between animal based, if that's what you do primarily, versus like a plant based protein approach. Totally. I mean, so I mean, I'm very, I'm there are very specific situations. Like you had my good friend Owen here on the show who does uh, a plant based ketogenic diet for his for his thymoidal cancer, and it's worked really really well. And so I'm someone that's pretty open minded as far as like what works for certain things, but as as far as like a species appropriate diet goes, like humans were made to eat meat. If we were to like condense the human time frame of like our evolution into a 24 hour period, we've been eating meat for the whole 24 hours. And yeah. so we've been eating wheat for like, I think it was six minutes or something like that of that 24 hours. And then processed food is like seconds or something yeah. like that. And so, so if you think about that real quick, if you think about that, when people say keto is a fad diet, well, we've been doing keto for those 24 hours that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. The real fat diet is a standard American diet. That's, I don't know how many minutes that equates to, but it's a very small percentage of that 24 hours. Probably, I mean, probably barely a minute, you know, very, yeah. very short amount of time. And uh, I, I've really learned, especially in nutrition, like pretty much everything you hear in mainstream is almost the opposite is true. So you can mm -hmm. kind of use that rule of thumb. But as far as protein sources go, I mean, animals have the full array of amino acids that, that the human body needs. It has all the, the essential and the non-essential that we can't make within our body. Um, and, and plants just don't, you have to do this thing where you pair them and they're just, it's not as bioavailable. You don't absorb it as cleanly or at all sometimes. Mm -hmm. And there's just, I mean, there's this huge like plant-based movement, which I get it from its face, but it's complete rubbish. And, yeah. and so like, you can't go wrong. And the other misnomer is like red meat. I'm a huge fan of eating pretty fatty red meat, especially if you're on a ketogenic diet. I've had my lipid levels, like people worry about cholesterol. You need cholesterol to, to synthesize vitamin D. Uh, people that have low cholesterol on statins actually have a hard time, even if you get a lot of sunlight, synthesizing enough vitamin D because your body doesn't have enough cholesterol to, to have that, uh, that uh, interaction happen in your skin. And so mm -hmm. it's, I'd actually be worried about having too low cholesterol, especially in your brain. It can create things like dementia and, and other mm -hmm. problems that we're now seeing. Um, and so I don't, I, I've had my lipid levels checked. My HDL has never been higher. I think it was like 85 last time I checked. Terrific. My triglycerides are like 40, which is lower well, than they've ever been. And granted, I never had a lot, a lot of time to like get, become obese and like have my triglycerides be like 300. So I'm coming from a place where they've always kind of been okay. But my mm -hmm. HDL jumped 30 points, like from when I was on standard kind of bodybuilding diet, lots of oatmeal tons of carbs. Like I was eating 400 grams of carbs a day back, mm. back before all my stuff happened. Um, lipids are great. Um, so that, that protein one is, is really important. I think people shouldn't be afraid of eggs. I think eggs are great for your hormones. I had crashed testosterone. Like I was saying earlier, eating eggs and yolks save my testosterone. Like mm. it, it's insane. Um, so I'm a huge fan of, of, of animal based protein. And I think it's really like the only protein you should focus on really. Uh, for the majority of people. So yeah, agreed, especially because a lot of people when they make that transition from sugar burner to fat burner, they struggle with cravings mm -hmm. and carb craving sugar craving. So protein has that effect where it's really satiating It activates cholecystokinine, leptin, peptide YY. These are chemicals and hormones that are signaling to your brain and your stomach, put down the fork, you know, there's no need to go eat that cookie or eat the sweets or to get off course with your, you know, new keto lifestyle. And you get that with animal-based protein. You don't really get that too much with plant-based protein. And look, I'm also open-minded. You know, it works for some people. But for most people, 90% plus, it's like you want to really focus on animal-based protein. Grass-fed, grass-finished, eggs, like you mentioned, are terrific. Cholesterol is so important. People, that's the number, I don't know if this is similar to you, but the number one question that I get asked on my YouTube channel is, will eating fat raise my cholesterol or I started keto and my cholesterol went up and I'm like, that's great. Like what did everything else show? Where yeah. were your, did your inflammatory markers drop? Did your HDL go up? Total cholesterol doesn't mean anything. Mm. It, it means nothing. You know, and if your doctor is prescribing and recommending you take a statin based off of your total cholesterol alone or your total LDL alone, they are missing so many moving parts there. And even Harvard has come up with a study several years ago showing that more people die from heart disease with normal to low cholesterol than with high cholesterol. Cholesterol is very important. Your membrane is made up of 
partly cholesterol. Yeah, and I, I mean, stat, in my personal opinion, statins are the biggest pharmaceutical scam in the entire like medical industry. They're one of the most prescribed drugs. My dad's on statins. My dad's mm-hmm. one of those people who um, I love him and I'm helping him out, but he's kind of got that boomer mindset, which is cool. <laughs> I vibe with the music, but um, but uh, but he's he's always struggled with HDL. Always had low HDL. Always had high LDL like problems. Very much standard American diet, by the way. Like as far as background. Mm-hmm. But he always just told me like it's just genetic it runs in our family. My grand, my dad had heart attack at forty three. That's what he would tell me. And what he neglected to tell me was my grandpa was an alcoholic and a smoker, um, which mm-hmm. probably would cause the heart attack. But um, uh, it's just like I've seen so many people's numbers change for the better. Like you mentioned, inflammatory markers dropping your HSCRP, which is kind of like almost like like the main like uh, cardiac uh inflammatory marker mine is like 0.2 or something yeah it's horrific. something it's ridiculously low but i the, i see people all the time drop and like if you really want to dive into the cholesterol thing um look up dave feldman has a lot of good stuff yeah i, I was just hanging out with him in orlando last week and yeah he's great yeah he has a calculator you can plug it in on his website yeah. it's kind of a good it's a good rule of thumb but if you really want to check your cholesterol, you want to look at the LDL um, particle size, and you can actually ask mm-hmm. your your doctor or cardiologist for that. And what you'll probably find if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're following it um, pretty like pretty on point, you'll probably see that your LDL cholesterol is this big, fluffy looking uh, particles, and that's actually totally fine. There's nothing wrong mm-hmm. with that, and it's actually beneficial. So there's a reason yeah. the body makes LDL, and it's not because you're in danger; like you need it. Um, so. That's, that's something that totally was flipped on its head for me during my journey and like learning about keto totally just like reframe my mindset about everything I, I look at from a medical standpoint completely. But another one that I think people mess up on when they dive into um, keto is they jump in really, really fast. And, and I definitely did that. And I definitely did have repercussions, but I me was, too. I was so into it that I kind of just like, I think I just kind of trudge through what they call the keto flu <laughs> and i just like i just kept going Same. but um electrolytes are really huge um mm. in, in that because when your body loses um you're going to lose tons of water weight especially in the first like couple weeks when you remove all those carbs i think every gram of carb you hold uh consume holds three grams of water is that right something like three or four? yeah it's, it's up there yeah and so, so one, a one to three ratio so one gram of carbs, three grams of water weight. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you lose a lot of water weight and what you lose with that is, is a lot of electrolytes, particularly sodium. And actually I was sodium deficient, um, because Mm. not only was I doing keto, but I was going through these heavy metal detoxes. I was saunaing, I was exercising to sweat. I was taking hot baths to sweat. I was trying to sweat Mm. all the time. And I, uh, I, I got up one day and almost passed out. Um, like Mm. I stood up and like vision went out, ears went out. Uh, went to the doctor and my sodium was actually low in the blood, which is pretty hard to do. Um, yeah. So I, I had to start really salting my food. And I think I, at peak, I was probably getting like, I was probably eating almost like eight grams of salt a day. Wow. Yeah. Eight grams of salt. Yeah. That's and and that was to maintain like, uh, like a healthy level of sodium and chloride in my blood. And I don't know if that's just me or if I, I was sweating a lot guys. So like I was mm-hmm. probably sweating more than the average average citizen out there. I was like trying to get this metal out of me. So, mm-hmm. um, but, uh, so yeah, that was, I, I'm kind of around, like, I'm actually, I don't salt too much now, even when I'm really in keto right now. Cause I think my body's adjusted more, mm-hmm. but, uh, but those are really important. And I use just like Redmond's Relight cause they have really good ratios. Yeah. Or, great. So that's kind of my favorite for those, but kind of along with that is like people drop their carbs too fast. I think, especially when you're coming from sad, Yep. Um, and this is something we were talking about before we we went on to record this is that, I mean, I, I think you said, did you jump right in too? I did. And I was doing CrossFit at the same oh, time. Yeah, so you felt it. Yeah. yeah. Banged up. Long keto flu. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's not the right approach. You don't have to hurt and suffer to, to you know, make that transition. So I, I like that approach of going low and slow. If you're eating like the average American, 300 grams of carbs per day. Maybe you drop that like 250 on day one and then 225, 200, and eventually get under 50. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to hit that keto flu. Um, you don't have to get those symptoms from keto flu. That's literally the best way to do it. And I know people sort of, I mean, it's it's hard to like be patient and wait for it, but that's that's the mm-hmm. best thing you do is go low and slow. So that those are kind of my, my, my biggest things I see people make mistakes on in there. Same, yeah. So 
you know, I didn't ask you the question as we kind of land the plane here on the conversation. Um, how are your symptoms now? Like, how are you feeling now? How's your autoimmune, your neuropathy? Like, how are you doing right now? I'm actually really, I mean, overall, like compared to where I was three years ago, where I literally couldn't sleep. I was, I was up for a week at one point. I didn't sleep for a week. Wow. Um, I was having spasms. Like my arms would move independently of my control. Like I would just lay down and they'd like do this. Wow. It was, That's I scary. thought I had part, it was really bad. Um, since that day, um, my energy is back pretty much hundred percent ready to go every day. I can even have a day that's subpar sleep. And as long as it's not like days in a row, I'm pretty good. I, I, I snap back. Sleep has improved immensely since, since going ketogenic, like insanely. I used to wake up to pee all the time and I'm just like dead through the night, like a, like a, like I'm in a tomb or something. Um, but, uh, and as far as the neuropathy goes, I used to have to, if you look at really old photos of me on my Instagram, I used to wear either KT tape or wrist braces constantly. I would also wear my, my, uh, my brace for carpal tunnel all the time. And I haven't had to wear a brace in about a year. And so that is a huge win for me. I'm able to work out, um, not doing CrossFit. I'm not as, a, I'm not as like hip as you. But, uh, <laughs> I don't do it anymore. It's because yeah. I used to own a CrossFit gym. Fair, that's why. <laughs> fair. But I've gotten into, I've actually gotten into bouldering and climbing. So I'm able to do that Sweet. now. Yeah. So I'm pretty much living as best of a life as I can at the moment. And it's only getting better. So it's awesome. Complete 180. Yeah. And, and I, I love how, you know, you're, your, your purpose now is, you know, educating people on health and you're helping your girlfriend out who's having some health challenges right now, but your, your purpose came out of pain. And that's the same case for me and a lot of people out there. So I share that because if you're going through pain right now and a lot of suffering, there's another side to that. Like when you overcome that and you will overcome that, if you just keep doing what you need to do, like Ryan has done. And even with my story, when you overcome that, the other side is so amazing. It, it could reveal a whole new career, a whole new path. And you could start to help people going down that same path as you. Now, you know, as you share your story, there's somebody, there's a student in my academy, uh, Sherry, maybe you're watching and listening, Sherry. I actually think she has what you had, um, you know, based off of some of the symptoms she's been telling me. So I'm going to share this episode with her and uh, get her, you know, down to your work and maybe explore some of the things that you did. So I hope this was like a light bulb moment for so many people out there. The body's built to heal. It really is. And you were taking so many hits. I'm, I'm always amazed, Ryan, by how many hits the human body takes these days and how we're still able to function. Like yeah. you were taking hits from mercury, you were taking hits from mold, you were taking hits from a standard American diet. And it's like, you were still going like, and it's great how strong the human body is built. So as long as you start to start identifying things and removing it, the body could heal. And you're a perfect example of that. Totally agree. And I'd add to that, just enjoy the journey. Like you will gain so much knowledge through, I mean, it, you're, you're going to have up and downs. It's like a meandering river, this kind of healing journey, but like you learn so much I, I don't regret one minute of it and I don't regret having to have gone through it or I don't feel bad for myself. I, I feel honored to have been chosen to go through this struggle, to come out the other end and having had all this knowledge by 26 that I never would have had otherwise. And many people sadly don't experience their entire life. So mm -hmm. I'm actually grateful that this happened because I got to learn so much about myself and the capabilities that, that we all have to heal. Amen. Everything is on the way. Nothing's in the way. You know, rockets fail their way to the moon. It's just course correct, course correct. Boom, you land to where you want to get to. Ryan, where can my Keto Camp audience check you out? Share your Instagram, your website. You got an awesome YouTube channel. Yeah, you can find me. Um, I'm very active on Instagram at Ryan Mitchell Brown. Mitchell spelled with one L. Don't ask me why. It's just, it's just my parents can't spell, I guess. But uh, I'm on TikTok at Keto Ryan. YouTube, Ryan Mitchell Brown, same as the Instagram and uh, my website's ryanmitchellbrown.com. Hit me up, reach out to me. I'd love to talk to any of you that are going through anything similar to what I did. But, uh, and I just love hearing stories. So thank you for having me on. I'm really, I really feel honored to be here. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll, we'll drop links down below. If you're watching on YouTube, it's down below in the YouTube notes. If you're listening on the podcast, it's down below in the notes. We'll put your website, your TikTok, your Instagram, your YouTube. Go subscribe to all of that. You also interview people on your YouTube channel, which is great. I, I got to get on your um, show as well. But Ryan, I want to um, acknowledge you, dude. I, I love your story. I love your energy, your attitude, your vibe. Um, it's super cool to see what you're doing at a, a very young age. And I'm excited to see you know, where this takes you. And 
three years, five years, 10 years, uh, you're going to be, you know, one of those leading authorities because you're doing it at such a young age. So I'm honored to see this journey for you. And I look forward to uh, more conversations and collaborations with you. So thank you for today, dude. I appreciate it.